Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Iron Coffins Part 25. 8.05 a.m. The convoy was still out of sight, but Siegmann ordered all the tubes flooded. 8.10 a.m. I reported all the torpedoes ready for attack. The rhythmic pounding sound of the convoy echoed louder through the depths. 8.16 a.m. The sonar operator reported through the voice tube. Convoy has changed course. Sound band shifted to 310 degrees. Siegmann's plan for an underwater attack was suddenly ruined. The commander, annoyed by the unexpected course change, extended the periscope to get an overview of the convoy. The humming sounds of numerous destroyers echoed sharply through the depth and the dull, grinding roar of the mighty armada hit the steel of our pressure hull like the deep beats of countless jungle drums. Damn trick, grumbled Siegmann. The convoy actually zigzagged northeast. About a dozen corvettes are spread across its starboard side. They're right between us and them. While U-230, undetected by the distant security, silently glided, the convoy steamed away at 11 knots. We were unable to close the gap. The rhythmic thumping of over a hundred screws penetrated the steel of our outer hull and seemed to resonate within the boat. The commander left his seat at the periscope and growled, Come XO, take a look at this. If I had a faster boat, I could roll up the convoy like a carpet. I swung into the chair. Seven miles to port, I saw an astonishing sight. The entire horizon, as far as my eye could see, was thickly covered with smokestacks and masts like a forest. Fast destroyers cut through the choppy green sea with arrogant elegance. Probably two dozen of these swift corvettes were darting in the wake of the convoy. I said in amazement, this is probably the largest convoy we've ever had in our sights. You may be right, Exo. When we get to the giant wall of ships, our eels can't go wrong. Before we could risk surfacing and charging into a new firing position, we had to put a considerable distance between us and the convoy. The hissing of the screws and the knocking of the piston engines, the singing of the turbines and the chirping of the astic pulses accompanied us on our mysterious journey through the depths. For almost an hour we ran diagonally away from the steel giants and prepared for a surface pursuit. 9.30 am. Surfaced. I followed Siegmann onto the bridge. The upper deck was still submerged. We took a quick survey and farther away in the northeast the mast tips moved along the sharp line that separated the sea from the sky. U-230 quickly gained speed and worked its way along the edge of visibility through a steadily increasing sea. The wind came from the west, force 5 to 6, and the sea state was 4. Our course was parallel to the convoy. Our speed was all the diesels could give. Siegmann intended to place us in front of the convoy by all means to conduct a new underwater attack before nightfall. 9.55 am. A sudden cry behind me. Aircraft! I saw the single engine plane descending from the clouds toward us. The surprise was complete. Alarm! We rushed headlong into the tower. The boat reacted immediately and quickly dove. Four short explosions, the water around us trembled, cracked and roared. The boat shook, reared up and then plunged into the depths with a 50 degree downward trim. Water splashed, steel screamed, frames creaked, valves burst, corridor plates clattered. The boat sank into complete darkness. When the emergency lighting flickered on, I looked into the astonished eyes of the crew. They had every right to be amazed. The attack from the sun was a complete mystery. Where had the small aircraft come from? It did not have the range to shuttle back and forth between the nearest airfield on land and our location in the Atlantic. The conclusion was disappointing but undeniable. The convoy itself now had its own air cover. As much as we resisted the truth, it was unmistakable that the plane returned to the convoy and landed on an aircraft carrier. The fact that a convoy now had its own air cover destroyed our basic principles of submarine warfare. After this opening move, we realized with bitterness that we were no longer able to conduct a surprise attack or secure our escape without drawing wild countermeasures from the enemy in the air. 10.35 am. U-230 surfaced. A careful look around with our air target periscope revealed no aircraft. We surfaced at high speed. And then the hunt continued. The diesels hammered and pushed the boat steadily eastward through foam-capped waves. I only occasionally cast a brief glance at the dense forest of masts along the horizon and focused on the sky. Fluffy white clouds followed us at a moderate altitude, driven by a stiff breeze. The wind whipped the water on deck, occasionally blowing foam shreds onto the bridge. 
11.10 a.m. I spotted a glint of metal high above us in the clouds. An aircraft began to dive. Alarm! 50 seconds later, four heart detonations taught us that the pilot was also a good bombardier. The shockwaves shook the boat, it crackled, crashed and barked. Now, don't lose your nerves, breathe deeply and keep your senses. Friedrich, the chief engineer, fought with all his might to prevent the boat from sinking. He caught it at 180 meters. 11.25 am. We surfaced. We surged forward, always forward, and hugged the outskirts of the convoy. It was pure instinct that drove us forward, forced us to continue pursuing the convoy. Instinct that made us indifferent to the repeated detonations. Despite the lurking danger from the air, we pressed on towards the head of the prey. 11.42 am. Aircraft alarm! U-230 plunged into the depths. Four mighty impacts whipped the pressure hull, throwing the crew through the boat. U-230 survived these detonations as well and with pumping lungs we waited in silence until the plane had flown away. 12.04 pm. Surfaced again. The sea had significantly increased in the meantime. The waves had white caps and the boat trembled under their blows. But we continued eastward, forward. Despite our insane diving maneuvers, the formation had fallen significantly astern and despite the constant harassment from the air, we had reached a favorable position. I spotted the sweepers of the convoy at the limit of visibility, about 16 nautical miles to the west-northwest. There was no danger from them. Death lurked in the air, where the clouds moved low and fast, covering the last blue patches of the Atlantic sky. 12.08 pm. A call came from below the bridge. Message to the captain. Short signal just received. Attacked by aircraft. U-89. A new loss, a new blow. We were stunned and shaken. 12.17 pm. Aircraft astern, alarm! U-230 immediately dove. It sank at the fastest speed. I bit my lip and waited for the horrifying blast, the last one I would hear. 45 seconds and four deafening blows struck the boat. Seconds decided between life and death. Every second we could rest from the aircraft brought us closer to the convoy and success. If we submerged just a second too late, the bombs would turn our boat into a giant coffin. 12.30 pm. On the surface again. There were only three men on the bridge. The commander, Rocha the first seaman and myself. We steered northeast, hunted by the tormenting thought of having to die within an hour. 1.15 pm. Suddenly a single engine biplane fell out of a low cloud only 800 meters astern. It was way too late to dive. The moment of shock froze us and then we acted. Siegmann shouted, hard to starboard. I jumped aft to the cigarette deck to shoot. Rocher manned the second gun. The approaching machine quickly turned into a monster in a fraction of seconds. It swooped down on us and fired from all onboard guns into our open bridge. The boat turned slowly. I desperately pressed the trigger of my 20mm gun, but there was a misfire. Rocher yelled in anger, his gun too misfired. Then the machine dropped its bombs. I saw the black cases falling towards me, the airplane pulled up, shot just above our bridge and spewed hot gases into our faces. Then, four explosions. Four fountains along our starboard side. The heart blows threw us sideways and then the geysers collapsed over us. The boat sank. No, it rose from the roaring sea and continued undamaged. The plane, relieved of its load, turned away and disappeared immediately towards the convoy. 1.30 pm. Riedel passed an urgent message through the hatch. BD-42, aerial bombardment. I'm ready to dive, aircraft tracking, urgently requesting help. U-456. Let Praga determine the exact location, Riedel, Siegmann shouted back. We have to save the crew. They must be very close to us. The commander's impulsive reaction to save his comrade Teichert from drowning could very well end in suicide. We were closer to death than life, but help had to be risked. We expected the same from others when our hull had burst. Moments later, Praga reported that U-456 was only 12 miles and 15 degrees to starboard. Siegmann immediately changed course. 1.50 pm. We spotted an aircraft four miles ahead. It did not approach. It circled over a spot. Then, my binoculars picked up the bow of U-456. It protruded only slightly from the churning sea and the men of U-456 clung to the steel cable leading from the bridge to the bow, standing chest deep in the water. And above them, the plane circled. The boat was sinking and help was impossible. We ourselves were suddenly in great danger. 
Then a new threat crawled over the horizon, a corvette, undoubtedly summoned by the plane. We sharply turned and fled towards the convoy. My thoughts about the fate of Teicher's boat were abruptly interrupted by Riedel's shout. Aircraft astern! It was 2.22 p.m., too late to dive. The single-engine machine came in low and straight over our wake. Again, I fumbled with my gun and again it jammed. I kicked the magazine with my boot, it released and then jammed again. Riedel's automatic barked briefly. The approaching machine grew into a monster in a fraction of seconds again and it was already swooping down on us and firing precisely from the right. But suddenly, the engine of the machine sputtered, it wobbled, touched a wave crest with a wing, then crashed with full force into the next wave, smashed the end of a wing against our superstructure and broke into two in the foam of the wave. I saw the pilot being thrown out of the machine, saw in passing how he raised his arm and waved for help and then saw how he was torn apart by the explosions of his four bombs, which were intended for us. Four intense blows on the starboard side, spray soaked us but... U-230 left the shocking scene undamaged. The crash of the machine seemed to have disoriented the opponent's flight routine. Minute after minute passed without the attacks repeating. They were minutes of agonizing tension. Minutes in which we surged towards with all our might and fought for a favorable position towards the convoy. We calculated that in just one more hour we could break into the general course of deformation, dive and shoot. 3.45 p.m. A new message from the radio room. Message to the captain. U-186 no longer responds to repeated orders from command. This new loss was the 11th since the beginning of our mission. A catastrophe of the greatest magnitude seemed to be imminent. 4 p.m. U-230 intercepted the extended general course of the formation. In the clear air, I saw four columns of massive ships steaming towards us from the southwest. We had to stop these giants, had to spread fire and destruction in their midst and tear deep gaps into the mass of iron and steel. 4.03 pm. Aircraft at 320 degrees. We fell heavily into the depths. Four barbaric detonations followed. The boat was shaken as if by a giant fist and pushed downward. The rudders and the diving planes were jammed in a down position. Water level glasses burst. Suddenly, darkness. Then more explosions shook the boat, after that a long rumbling roll. Soon we could hear the grinding, thrashing roar of the giant convoy with our naked ears. Siegmann ordered the boat to 15 meters. Minutes later, he cautiously raised the periscope but immediately retracted it and cursed. Damn it! The guy threw a smoke bomb and he dyed the water yellow. Despite the color spot marking our diving position, the commander ordered the attack on the convoy before the escort vessels had time and opportunity to pounce on us. Chirping Aztec poses, barking detonations and the roar of over a hundred ship engines formed the musical background of our attack. 4.38 pm. Upscope. Quick glance around, sudden alarm and then Siegmann's command. Tubes 1 to 5, ready for underwater shot. Quickly, quickly XO, where are the reports? Tubes 1 to 5 are ready, I quickly replied and held my breath. Something had to be happening above. Siegmann spun wildly around the axis of the periscope. I saw his free left eye moving in a circle. Then he shouted as if struck by lightning. Dive the boat, chief! Dive for God's sake! Destroyer in ramming position! Dive to 200 meters! Close the outer doors! I shouted in between, expecting any moment that the sharp bow of a destroyer would cut into the tower. The boat tilted, but only slowly. The sound of approaching screws hit the steel of our outer hull with alarming violence. The noise grew so quickly and echoed so shrilly that we were all unable to react. Only the electric motors in the aft room worked precisely, but the boat sank only slowly, too slowly, to escape the destructive blow. What followed was an ear-deafening explosion, then a second, a third. A series of six depth charges hurled the boat back to the surface, where four destroyers had set course for the death blow. There was a silence for seconds, and for seconds the screws of our boat spun at the highest revolutions. For seconds the boat lay on the water, and for seconds the British were surprised. Then. After what seemed like an eternity, the bow tilted, dipped under and the boat sank and sank. A new series of exploding canisters threw our stern back up with magical force. U-230, completely out of control, plunged into a strong forward trim and was catapulted towards the sea floor, five miles beneath our keel. U-230 fell with a 50 degree forward trim like a stone into the depths. At about 250 meters, the chief engineer accomplished his masterpiece. 
He stopped the rapid descent, leveled off and trimmed the boat. Then he set it on an even keel, all in record time. The boat glided almost silently at a depth of 230 meters and trimmed for a long sonar pursuit. It moved away with a slight forward trim but a light upward tendency under the keel of the pursuers. 4.57 pm. A new series of bombs stunned us and took our breath away. The steel of the pressure hull knocked, groaned, squeaked dangerously. Valves were thrown into open positions. The two shaft seals took on water heavily. A small waterfall filled the aft bilge and additionally increased the boat's weight. 7.40 pm. Three hours later and the turmoil was at its peak. A sudden clap on the surface warned us of a new salvo. We had about 15 seconds to prepare for a new devastating blow and then it seemed the world was ending. While the Atlantic quivered under the volcanic eruption of countless explosive charges, the huge convoy procession passed over the site of our execution. I imagined the freighters making a respectful curve around the destroyers that had gathered over our grave to obliterate us. Should we try to go deeper? But where was the crush death, the line between life and death? I didn't know where this limit was, at what depth our pressure hull would be crushed. No one on board knew. Those who had found out this limit had taken their knowledge into the depths to their graves. Hours passed. For hours we endured the scourging and the torment and sank ever deeper. Well-aimed throws and series of 24 depth charges hit our boat every 20 minutes. Once it was already evening, we thought we'd won. That was when the hunting group steamed off in a northeasterly direction to join the convoy and take up its old position. But our hope for an end to the ordeal was short-lived. The hunters had left the death blow to the sweepers following in the wake of the massive convoy. When the new group began its first approach, a miserable tearing, screaming and roaring sound emerged. A second attempt followed and then a third. We sat helplessly under a water column of 265 meters. Our nerves trembled, our muscles vibrated, our bodies were stiff from the cold, fear and indescribable tension. The bilges emitted a foul smell, were flooded with seawater, urine and oil. Our washrooms were sealed. The opening of an outboard hatch, such as the toilet, would immediately flood the boat. Cans, half filled with diesel fuel, were passed around for men to relieve themselves. Our kidneys worked excessively and the bilges took in what the cans couldn't hold. The stench of excrement, diesel oil and sweat mixed with the foul odor of battery gases. The increasing humidity condensed on the pressure hull, ran into the bilges, dripped from tubes and soaked our clothing. At midnight, Siegmann realized that the British had no intention of stopping the bombardment. He ordered distributing of potassium cartridges to ease our breathing and save oxygen. Soon, everyone had one of the large metal cans strapped around them. With a rubber hose between our teeth and a nose clip on our faces, we looked like creatures from another planet. And still, we crouched and waited, waited, and the boat sank ever deeper and deeper. The next day, May the 10th. Over 200 depth charges had exploded above and around us. It had become 1 am and we had already tried several times to use a ruse, but without success. Through a small outboard valve, we had ejected a bolt. A small swimmer which dissolved in salt water and caused a huge bubbling fishnet. This screen of myriads of foam pearls formed a solid wall onto which the opponent's ASTIC device responded and behind which we tried to disappear. But our pursuers only chased twice after the bait and in both cases they left a sweeper over our boat. Unable to shake off the pursuers we gave up and focused on saving electricity, compressed air and our dangerously diminishing oxygen supply. 4 AM the boat had descended to 275 meters. We had been exposed to attacks for over 12 hours and there was no sign of the pursuit relenting. This day was my birthday and I wondered if it would be my last. 8 am. Still no let up in the attacks. The water in the bilges had risen above the deck plates and splashed around our feet. The bilge pumps were useless at this depth. Each time a series of depth charges exploded, the chief engineer released compressed air into the dive cells to ensure the boat's buoyancy. But how long could he sustain this measure before the air supply ran out? 12 pm. The buoyancy of the boat had significantly increased. Our supply of compressed air was nearly depleted and the boat continued to sink. 8 pm. The air was thick, poor and burned like fire when we breathed it through our hot potassium cartridges. Men lay everywhere, gasping for breath. Our oxygen supply was also exhausted. Under the tremendous external pressure, our steel hull groaned and creaked. 
10 p.m. The water bomb onslaught intensified as darkness descended over the sea. Fierce attacks at shorter intervals indicated that the Tommies had lost patience. May the 14th. Around midnight we had sunk to a depth of 280 meters and the boat continued to descend, faster, unstoppable. I dragged myself through the central passageway, nudging a man here and shaking a man there, forcing them to stay awake. Anyone falling asleep now had no chance of waking up again. 3.10 a.m. A new series thundered down on us, luckily without effect. We were closer to being crushed by the increasing external pressure than being torn apart by the exploding death charges. But when the echo of the last charge subsided, we heard something peculiar. It was the thrashing noise of departing screws. But we were unable to comprehend that the Tommies had given up the chase. 4.30 a.m. For over an hour there was silence. We spent the entire time doubting our luck. To check if we were indeed alone, the chief engineer turned on the fresh water generator and increased the revolutions of the electric motors. No reaction from above. With the help of the last atmospheric compressed air, Friedrich managed to lift the heavily submerged boat inch by inch. Then, suddenly, unable to stop its rapid upward movement, he let the boat shoot freely to the surface and called into the tower. Boat is ascending quickly. 50 meters. 30 meters. 15 meters. Tower's clear. Boat has surfaced. U-230 broke through the surface. Siegmann squeezed onto the bridge and I followed. Around us stretched the infinite night. The stars glittered magnificently and the sea breathed lightly. The moment of rebirth was overwhelming. Just a minute ago we could barely believe we had survived the battle. And now we could hardly grasp that death had its grip around our throats for 35 cruel hours. Our awakening was very miraculous. Suddenly, I felt the oxygen-rich air. I slumped to my knees, almost losing consciousness, and, and fell over the edge of the bridge casing. I hung there until the seizure passed. The same had happened to the captain, but he too recovered quickly, and we congratulated each other. Then Siegmund shouted, Both diesels ahead standard. Ventilate the boat, switch on battery charging, secure from battle stations, report all damages, new course, 180 degrees. The diesels came back to life. Since the convoy had long disappeared, we steered south toward our last known position. The engines hummed steadily, recharging our depleted batteries, and the boat moved towards a new sunrise. Repairs were made, the bilges pumped, the air renewed, and the waste thrown overboard. As darkness slowly lifted, U-230 was ready for action again. Still numb from the murderous battle and stiff from the cold of the depths, we took stock. Three boats from our group had been sunk. Against this loss stood over a hundred allied ships that had plowed past us. We could reasonably assume that over 700,000 tons of war material would reach the English island. It was indeed a not very encouraging picture. The day promised to be beautiful, the sky was cloudless and Praga emerged through the hedge onto the bridge and shot better stars before the sun could wipe them from the blue firmament. I lit a cigarette and watched the overwhelming sunrise with gratitude. 7.10 a.m. Smoke clouds dead ahead, Rojo exclaimed. All glasses turned and fixed on the dark spots that had formed over the horizon to the southwest. There was no doubt we had spotted a second convoy. At that moment, it occurred to me it was no coincidence that the U-boat hunting group had left us. They knew we would sooner or later fall into the hands of the following destroyers of the new convoy. 7.20 a.m. Alarm and we dived. The men, without sleep for over 70 hours, went to battle stations. Their hollow cheeks, narrow faces and reddened eyes conveyed to me that they too understood how much things had changed. 7.45 a.m. A voice came through the voice tube in the tower. Sonar to the captain. Propeller sounds shifting to starboard. Enemy course is east, not northeast. Siegmann muttered an unmistakable curse through his red beard, carefully scanned the surface with the periscope, but saw nothing. Then he ordered the chief to surface. I suddenly realized that this new convoy operation bore a damn resemblance to the one three days ago. 7.50 a.m. Surfaced. Siegmann rushed to the bridge and I followed. We checked the sky, then the formation, all within two seconds. It was immediately clear to us the parade had made its morning zigzag. The formation ran diagonally, exactly as the previous convoy had done. Was it a coincidence or detection? 
Without further hesitation, Siegmann initiated the attack. 8.22 am. Aircraft from the sun! Alarm. The rapid diving maneuver took us out of the range of the exploding bombs in time. The chief engineer caught the boat immediately and steered it to periscope death. The air was tense. Seconds later, Siegmann folded back the handles of the periscope targeting device, straightened up and grumbled irritably. To hell with these flyers! The plane dropped a smoke bomb. Let's get out of this unfriendly area. Chief, prepare for surface and blow ballast at full speed immediately. 8.32 am. We were back on the surface. U-230 turned eastward and quickly moved away from the thick black smoke plume that marked our diving spot. 8.55 am. A twin-engine plane approached from the stern. U-230 dived within 18 seconds. Four bombs tore through the sea. 9.15 am. Back on the surface. We raced forward. Always forward. Siegmann was handed a distress signal on the bridge. Bombed. U-640. 10.05 am. Alarm! An aircraft suddenly appeared in the air. U-230 dived in record time and when the thunder of the explosion subsided, we were surprised to find that the boat was still afloat. Again and again we surfaced and plunged into the depths with excessive buoyancy. We cowered under the blows, fevered under the bursting detonations. The boat seemed to fall apart beneath them. Rivets burst, screws shattered, bolts broke, frames bent and the pressure hull was dented like corrugated iron. But U-230 continued to obey Siegmann's orders, who repeatedly went for a new attack. At sunset, Siegmann's tenacity seemed to have been rewarded. Hidden from view by the curvature of the earth, we had worked ourselves 25 miles ahead of the convoy. But then, an air attack forced us back into the depths. Siegmann recognized his chance. While the convoy slowly plowed through the rising waves, our men rushed hastily to battle stations. Their movements betrayed restrained excitement. Determined, I prepared the torpedo weapons for a nocturnal surface battle. But there was no new success. In the turmoil and noise of the approaching convoy, three corvettes had managed to sneak up to our diving spot. Siegmann saw them and shouted, Quickly, dive to 200 meters! Attention! Death charges! Seconds later, the destroyers presented us with a lavish gift. A thick carpet of depth charges, surpassing all previous series, exploded like a volcanic eruption. Total darkness followed the deafening roar. U-230 sank like a stone. I straightened up at the periscope in the control room, shone my flashlight on the depth gauge, saw with horror how the needle swung sharply, saw the two dive plane operators in complete confusion at the large hand wheels, listened to the desperate commands of the chief engineer and to the sound of water breaking in. Then the bow lifted, the boat swung through and settled on an even keel. Thus began a new death charge battle. It developed into an exact replica of the pursuit we had endured in the last convoy. As night fell, the wind subsided, the sea smoothed out and the battle grew more intense. Wild salvos made the Atlantic resound and echo. We shivered with cold, trembled with tension. We were hot and cold and numb and during this night toxic gases escaped from our batteries. We were near helplessness. Men vomited into the bilges, wheezed from shortness of breath, our oxygen battles were long empty, used up during the last pursuit. And as the sun rose again, our pursuers renewed the attacks with utmost intensity. We counted over 300 death charges that they wasted on us fruitlessly. But U-230 continued to glide in the incredible death of 280 meters just a few meters below the exploding canisters. In the afternoon, we faced the fact that there was no way out for us. The breathing air was exhausted, the oxygen supply was depleted, the batteries were nearly discharged. We had to choose between suicide and surrender. In his last effort to wrest another hour from death or captivity and prevent the boat from sinking, the chief engineer released new compressed air into diving cell number three. The hissing sound immediately attracted the attention of the pursuers. A mad explosion threw the boat upwards. The detonation was under the stern and the air in the dive cells expanded, the boat shot upward. A new series exploded over the aft deck and pushed the boat back into the depths. We crawled forward through the central passage to shift our weight. The bow lowered very gently, the boat swung through and U-230 shook near the 300 meter limit. The men bit on the mouthpieces of their potassium cartridges and sucked the hot air into their lungs. They coughed, wheezed. 
Eight minutes after the last explosion, U-230 was still alive and continued to glide through the depths. Then, six death charges exploded further aft. After that, everything was silent for over an hour. Not a ping, not a beep, not a sound could be heard from above. Since we had long passed the limit of our oxygen content, we tried to force the Tommies into a reaction with a hammer blow against the pressure hull. But everything remained eerily quiet. After another 20 minutes, U-230 began its slow ascent. 7.55 pm. The hatch cover of the tower flew open. Siegmann and I were thrown onto the bridge by the now significantly increased internal pressure. Bright sunlight greeted us. There was an abundance of air, but no opponent as far as the eye could see. As we carefully surveyed our damage after taking a careful look around, we realized why the Brits had abandoned the pursuit and disappeared so quickly. The boat was a total wreck. Two outboard bunkers were ruptured, the starboard shaft was bent, the foundation of the starboard diesel was cracked and numerous minor damages completed the list. A very large amount of fuel had been sacrificed to Neptune. The continuation of our mission was impossible and even the return to base seemed questionable. We were stranded in the Atlantic. And with this devastating damage assessment, we turn to the after action report. There are a few things to talk about here. First, the tenacity of these men. It is absolutely incredible how they all persevere after being hounded like it was described. Being submerged for days, having to breathe via an apparatus, having to piss and shit into the bilge and diesel-filled containers, it's hard to describe the hardships that had to have been overcome. And still, morale did not break, and the captain was determined to conduct even another attack. These men were truly built different. But... The new threat of escort carriers has changed the game, and while the boats could operate relatively freely and safe from air attack in certain areas of the North Atlantic before, the arrival of the escort carrier made life considerably more dangerous for the crews. Escort carriers, for those of you who don't know, were smaller carriers that were also relatively slow and could only keep up with merchant ships, but they provided mobile air cover and were as such extremely valuable. The constant threat of air attacks that now loomed over the boats was described quite vividly by Herbert in this episode. Coupled that with the apparent unreliable nature of the AA guns on U-230, this transformed travel on the surface into a pure game of chance. Interestingly enough though, the crash of the non-descript bomber was quite a surprise and I found the corresponding entry in U-230's war diary, where the description of this event by the captain matches Herbert's account pretty much exactly. I will put it on screen for you. The captain also mentions the bent shaft. Also noteworthy is the use of the so-called Bolt acoustic decoy. Uh, Bolt is short for Kobold, which means goblin in German. The device would be ejected from a launcher and create a screen of bubbles that would reflect ASDIC as well as mimic screw noises. However, it is of only limited use at 1. it is stationary and also, if there are multiple attackers, they can easily detect it. So, we will see how U-230 gets back to France in the next episode. If you have made it this far, first of all, thank you. Second of all, you can as of now become a channel member and receive neat benefits such as badges, custom emojis, exclusive videos and more, while also helping me out starting at 1.99 per month. Check it out if you like. Until then, stay safe. Merry Christmas to you and your loved ones. Cheers. Bye bye.